How can one explain to the people over there that they are fascists? In Russia, there's only one traditional value, and that's power. It pains me to be Russian. It pains me to be a Russian writer. Shishkin is a traitor. Death to traitors. Mikhail, in every episode of our program on the record, we start by trying to simply explain to the viewer how our main character ended up where they are. Let's start with just trying to describe where you and I currently are. We're in Switzerland. And normally one doesn't end up in Switzerland after starting off in Russia. People usually end up in Germany, Israel or in America. But in the beginning there was love, and once upon a time, many moons ago, my translator and I got married. At first I thought she was from Germany because she was translating into German. That was back in 1994. Later, when she was pregnant, she said, enough with the Russian traditions, enough already. We have no grandmother, no doctors, no money. We're leaving for Switzerland. That's how I ended up in Switzerland. I had to earn money somehow, so I worked as an interpreter in the migration service, translating interviews with refugees. I was employed by various translation and interpretation agencies and found myself in the very center of this giant machine which launders dirty money from Russia. Because everybody wanted to come to Switzerland to open a bank account. And the interpreter is the one who sees everything, knows everything. Is that true that your first job provided many of the stories for the book Maiden Hair? Let me tell you about it. People tell stories, non-fictional or fictional, but with something that really happened to someone, maybe not to them. And I remember very well that my fellow Russian writers were saying, what are you going to write about in Switzerland, Shishkin? About the tram being behind schedule? But with this job, I found myself in the middle of dreadful Russian stories. And the only way to cleanse my mind of them was to write about them. But when you read this book, you can't help but wonder, is it all true or is it the writer's imagination? Did you have to make anything up? I was just mentioning that I was forced to step into the world of money laundering. You know, for me, it was a very big, important lesson. I realized what was going on in Russia and what was happening in the West and why that was even possible. You see, in the beginning, in the 1990s, after the Soviet Union collapsed, People were ready for democracy, without really understanding what that was. They had never experienced living under the rule of law, but they had all watched American movies. So for them it was, we want to be like America, like Switzerland, we want to have McDonald's, we want to have free elections, we want to have a constitution, we want it all. The West was supposed to help the young Russian democracy stand on its own two feet. How is it supposed to do that? No need for laws. There are enough laws. No need for credit. There is enough money in Russia. The West needed to lead by example. Show what democracy is, how it works. I mean, it's very simple. Here you go, here are the laws. If you violate them, you're going to jail. That's it. Nothing more. What did Switzerland do? What did other Western democracies do to the young Russian democracy? When people came to Switzerland with massive amounts of dirty money, everyone knew it was dirty, that they were breaking the law. Lawyers, bankers, everyone. But everyone was so happy to see that money. You know what I mean? And in Russia, they took it as, so that's what democracy is. When it comes to big bucks, the rule of law is abandoned. When you and I were first arranging this interview, there was war in Ukraine, and then a war in Armenia and Azerbaijan, a war which for some reason was hardly noticed by the world media. 
And now you and I are witnessing a third war in the Middle East. Do you still believe that the world can be balanced somewhere? Is there a place where people can be happy, in countries like Switzerland maybe, or somewhere else? You know, in the novel, that's how my hero talks. That's a bit of irony, asking how you can be happy when the whole world has transformed into one big room. And all these wars, all these deaths, come directly to your doorstep through telegram feeds. How can you be happy? How can you forget all this? We're at war. And this war used to be somewhere far away on TV. Now the war is everywhere. And the front lines are also everywhere. And due to this war, I'm getting threats. I got an email from Germany, written in Russian. Shishkin is a traitor. Death to traitors. And so what now? Should I shut up now after that? Are people silent? Retreating again into silence? But you've never been silent. Silence can be counted only by words. I won't be silent. If I stay silent, then what's the point of my life? Do you think it's possible to build bridges between Russia and Ukraine? Today we speak of Russian culture and of the Russian language. Yet if we think of the Ukrainians who are the victims, are they likely to reject the Russian language and Russian culture after the war ends? Even with the Ukrainian victory? It's a tragedy. We've never seen the likes of this before in Russian history, in the history of Russian culture, to the extent that the Russian language has become stained with blood. So each person must play their part, especially if they speak Russian in their daily lives. The dignity of Russian literature can only be preserved, I think, in a novel. A novel of atonement. It shouldn't be written by an émigré, but rather by someone who really lay in the trenches in Ukraine and asked himself the question, who am I? What am I doing here? What's the purpose of this war? To what end? What are we Russians doing over here killing people? Why are we Russians fascists? If such a novel were to be written, it would be to give Russian culture a chance, a future. But whether or not it will actually be written, God only knows. Mikhail, you are a Russian writer living in Switzerland. Your mother is Ukrainian and your father is Russian. How do you feel today? What's your identity? First of all, in answering such a question, I have to admit that I'm happy that my mum and dad passed away before all this, that they didn't have to live through this. It's horrible to say something like that about one's parents, but I'm actually glad. It pains me to be Russian. It pains me to be a Russian writer. And in fact, now we have to redefine all of these words. What is Russian literature? What is Russian culture? What is Russia? What is it to be Russian? Your latest book, War or Peace, begins with this phrase in French, ça fait mal d'être russe, it hurts to be Russian. But as you yourself don't identify with that power, you don't even identify with that country. And when you have such a clear anti-war message, why does it still pain you to be Russian? You say the Russian language is the language of Pushkin, Tolstoy, Tsvitaeva, and has now become the language of war criminals. But you are proof of a different Russia. 
Indeed, in the past, the Russian language was attributed to Rachmaninoff and Bunin. Now, when you hear it, it's primarily associated with the crimes committed by those who speak Russian. And it turns out that now, my job as a writer is to justify to the world that the Russian language is not the language of murderers. That there is, after all, a Russian culture which opposes this war. There is another Russia. There are other Russians. And the salvation of this Russian culture is, first and foremost, to be found right now in supporting Ukraine in the war against our common enemy. Because the main enemy of Russian culture always was, is, and will be the Russian state. The main enemy of Russian culture is the Russian regime. Now, if people stay in Russia, they either have to sing to the tune of the nation, or keep quiet, or emigrate. Emigration has now become an act of resistance. And it's very important to explain it to people. I live in the West and explain to people in the West what's really going on. That's actually why I wrote this book. The last two chapters are dedicated to the future. And there, I describe everything that's going to happen. That future has already come to the fore. But, unfortunately, what's going on right now is going on absolutely to the letter of the scenario I predicted. And when the full-scale invasion started suddenly, this book was being translated into, I don't know, every single language, like over 20 languages. And I got so much feedback. People are like, oh, why were our politicians so blind? Because politicians don't listen to writers. There was an opportunity to put a stop to this aggression, this war. Think back to the Sochi Olympics. I was in Switzerland calling for the games to be boycotted. It was in the papers, it was on television. I was trying to explain to people that if you go there, you show solidarity with a thug regime, which has taken hostages throughout the entire country. Whereas if you don't go there, you will show your solidarity with those young, wonderful people who speak out against the regime in the streets, and who are then beaten and imprisoned. Did you know no one was taking you seriously? Who listens to writers? In Sochi, Switzerland built a Swiss chalet where the president of the first and the best European democracy personally licked the dictator's boots. And how was Putin supposed to take all that? Yeah, we know how it ended. Right after the Olympics came the annexation of Crimea, which began this war. But, you remember, on February the 24th, the president of Switzerland announced, we are a neutral country, we will not support sanctions against Russia. All these years, I felt like I was banging my head against a brick wall. This obviously needs to be beaten into people's minds, until you break through. On February the 25th, the next day, I was speaking on the TV show Arena. It was the prime political TV show on Swiss-German language television. Naturally, they were discussing the war and how to react. I said, dear Switzerland, the time for neutrality has passed. I explained why Switzerland should sacrifice its sacred cow and help Ukraine. Yeah, and that's the way democracy works. You see, in a dictatorship, those at the bottom remain silent. It's the one thing that the authorities require from the public. Silence.
You are saying that writers are incapable or not always capable of explaining Putin to the Western world. Who can explain Putin? Is what Putin says or does not enough to prove what is going on? <coughs> well, that's what I think. It's kind of like explaining that you don't need to know anything else. We need to look at actions, but everyone still wants words. In the West, we are used to listening to words. The difference is that in Russia, words mean nothing. In Russia, lying is so ingrained. For generations, we've all been so used to living a lie, so much so that the people are ready for any lie, lapping it up from the authorities. And that can be explained in only one way. You see, in the West, the people are not dependent on the government. Power needs people. In Russia, the people are always hostages. Well, that's not a very encouraging prognosis at all. So does it mean that there is no way out, no cure for this disease, no way to relieve these symptoms? Well, at heart, at heart, I'm an optimist. I'm counting on humanity to keep evolving along the same lines of those immutable laws, like the laws of nature. All rivers flow into the ocean. At some point, humankind will evolve according to the laws of humanity. A hundred thousand years ago, the future Swiss were still eating each other alive. And now, we're trying to build a society where the strong have no advantage over the weak and there are laws that protect the weak from the strong. That's why, in principle, living in a democracy is comfortable and beneficial. Look at Putin's oligarchs. Why did they all want to have real estate in the West? Because it's not as easy to simply confiscate private property here. Whereas under a dictatorship, you're an oligarch today, take Khodorkovsky, and tomorrow it's all taken away from you and you find yourself in jail. That's why I'm sure that, sooner or later, all countries will transition to a democratic system, where the state will stand watch over the weak and the strong won't try anything. But it's just that some countries, some peoples over history, have managed to take the shortcut there, whereas others have had to go round in circles. We parts of that majority of humans who are still going round and round in circles. Will Russians achieve democracy on their own or with a big push from outside, from the West, as you said? If you look at it today, in order to establish democracy in Russia, certain conditions must be met. There must be, first of all, Ukraine's victory in this war. This regime must be defeated. There should be an admission or confession of national guilt. As happened after World War II, when the Germans were forced to recognize their responsibility as a nation. But we can imagine the following. Whoever follows Putin shall, as the German Chancellor did in Warsaw, kneel in Butcher, in Irpin, in Kharkov, in Kiev, and in all countries where there are Russian tanks, in Budapest, in Prague, in Vilnius, in Tbilisi. It's hard to imagine. This is not the makings of a Tsar. If a Tsar kneels down anywhere, he's not a real Tsar. There has to be a Nuremberg-style trial. Everyone whose hands have been dirtied in this evil war should be punished. A Nuremberg trial organized by the occupying authorities. Who will occupy Russia and set up a Nuremberg tribunal for all the war criminals? Who's going to steward it? Who will adjudicate? The judges in power? Who's going to put them in jail? The current police force? Our military? A country can't put its entire self in jail, especially because Russia is already in jail. 
So, in order to establish democracy, there must be a critical mass of citizens who understand what democracy is and why we have it. They must be willing to live in a democracy and willing to abide by laws and live under the rule of law. You see, it's very common here in the West for people to think that in Russia it's all about propaganda. That Russians don't have alternative sources of information. But that's not the issue. For all these years in Russia, there has been Echo Moscow and the TV channel Dozhd. If you really wanted to hear another truth, it would be easy to find. But imagine that there are two truths and you happen to be parents of a young man who died in Ukraine. One truth is, your son is a fascist. Ukrainians just wanted to build a new life, to join Europe, to build a democracy. He went there to kill those Ukrainians. You are the parents of a fascist. Shame on you. The other truth is, your son is a hero. The Americans are waging war against us. They want to destroy us by using Ukrainian Nazis to do it. And your son went there to defend our culture, our language. He went over there to defend Pushkin. You are the parents of a hero. Be proud. How can one explain to these people that they have absolutely nothing to be proud of? It's very difficult. German-speaking part of Switzerland. What is this place? This is the capital of our district, a town called Laufen. No one knows about it. It's not a tourist hotspot. People have been here since the Middle Ages, living on their own, and they still do. It's a great place to live. If only it were possible to ignore what's going on behind these walls. War and the feeling that this war probably is just the beginning and that it will become a much bigger war with no one knowing when and how it's going to end. If only it were possible to forget about that, it would be fine. There is a lot of talk in Russia right now about traditional values without explaining what they are, but comparing them to Western values Russian officials say feminism is bad, that in the West, can you believe it, it's awful. People can raise a family with anyone they like. The Russian government says women don't need to be educated to have babies. In which ways do Russian traditional values differ from Swiss traditional values? In Russia, the only traditional value is power. There are written laws and unwritten laws. Russia lives by unwritten laws, the law of the jungle, the law of force. Whoever is in power is right. All this talk about values that we hear from propaganda, it's absolute rubbish. Because if tomorrow the authorities, in order to remain in the Kremlin, need to adopt a completely different set of values, for example, I don't know, Islam, then they'll adopt them in no time. And the Duma and all the senators and all the officials all over Russia will immediately convert to Islam. If the day after tomorrow they suddenly need to learn Chinese and become Chinese, well, they'll all instantly learn Chinese. Their values are only about staying in power and getting closer to power. That's all. You know, another part of the traditional values is that the whole world is your enemy and the entire world is a conspiracy against Russia. We can see whose side that power is on, on the side of its own kind, terrorists, murderers. They all understand each other. They're all doing the same thing. It's a war of dictatorships against democracies. Democracies are, alas, a minority in this world. But I'm very hopeful that they won't fold. 
Now in Russia, in Ukraine, in Israel and in Palestine, the exact same war is raging, the war of dictatorships against human freedom, against human needs. People are fighting to live without humiliation, fulfill their human needs, to live in dignity. But is there anything in Russia that you would like to go back to one day? You know, what's in Russia is what everyone who left wants to go back to but cannot. It's childhood, it's youth, it's the first love, but you can't go back to the past. Over the past year, I suddenly realized what Kazimir Malevich meant with his black square. You know, he did it unconsciously. An artist doesn't need intention, he needs a feeling, an instinct. The artist has a keen sense of what's to come, sensing the future. What was in his future? In his future was World War I, the monstrous civil war and the gulag. What I'm afraid of is that I'm not the only one who feels that the Russia of today is Malevich's black square.